I'm John Callies, and we're going to talk about the basics of crankshafts and what makes the difference between a standard crank and a racing crank. The nomenclature <clears throat> will start up here. This is the snout, and this is a naturally aspirated, so you have this keyway for your cam drive and for your dampener, and on a blown car you have two keys, one opposite. This is your first main. This is an eight counterweighted big block, four and three quarters stroke. And it's got everything done to it. In other words, the whole crank is polished, so we're starting with the top end piece. So number one main, two main, three, four, and five. Now this also acts as a thrust on a Chevrolet and your flange in the back. Number one, rod bearing, two, three, and four. Now the counterweights, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. A production engine, like we're seeing here, does not have center counterweights. My feeling, this is my personal feeling, is I like each to look like a single cylinder. So I want a counterweight opposite every rod journal. Now you'll notice that we have different shapes on the leading edge of the counterweight. Now you can have a bull nose, you can have an angle, each manufacturer has their own specialty. When this one was done the idea was to try and push the oil away from the rods towards the mains. And to be honest with you, to try and prove which one's better, it would be a very difficult, you'd have to be at one of the cup level d development dinos, and, and it, I don't know, it would be even worth the effort, okay? But anyway, that was what this manufacturer did. Oop, I forgot one thing, which was important. is you have heavy metal in the counterweights because this is a four and three quarter stroke. But one thing I wanted to show you is if I put this level on top of the mains, you see that there's distance between the bottom of the rod. Our overlap is terrible. And it's going to bend right in this overlap and that just starts cycling. Next thing is you're going to get cracks around here and cracks around here. Now, obviously material, radiuses, finishes bring the level up. But in all honesty, this is the weak point. So when you put heavy metal in, I've seen people put heavy metal through the end, which is absolutely wrong. And it's more work to do this, but you have to drill, ream, you want a 2000s press, and that heavy metal will not come out. And again, there's different types of heavy metal. So uh, the good manufacturers buy precision OD, so they don't have to mess with the heavy metal. So they buy it in the width and the diameter that's already ground. Now, on this particular crank, you see there's a hole here, here, and there's a hole. It's drilled from the back, and that's strictly a weight reduction item. Now, where you start in a dry sump pan, where you make different stages in there, you, when you have this, you can deflate what you're trying to do. But that that's another story. But anyway, this putting... Uh, the heavy metal in is, is very important to do it correctly. And I've, I've seen on the internet people drilling in the end and putting it in the end of the counterweight. And you do not ever want to take a chance of that thing flying out at seven, 8,000 RPM. The, uh, and the other thing is, you see the lightning holes here? Now the lightning holes the only reason they're there was to reduce crank weight. And 
over the years, what it became is, how big a hole can I put in there? Look at my crank. Look at the weight I took out. Unfortunately, there's a point where you get so big, when you get close to the oil hole, two, you cause more deflection. This hole does not help the structure of the crank. However, people demand it. So I'm just saying, there's a balance there. Now this is a blown up version, and I wanted to talk first of all on a racing crank. Uh, and what I'm talking, I'm talking a uh, high level of uh, companies, okay? So you have Winberg, Callies, Bryant, th those are what I'm saying, have the equipment, can do the proper job. What is important is the flatness of the rod, the flatness of the main, and what type of radiuses you put in. So a typical production crank will either have an undercut that's heat treated or a 80 thousandths to 90 thousandths max radius. Every racing crank, the minimum is going to be a 125. Then that causes the bearing manufacturer to either make a narrow bearing or you do it yourself. Okay, but now there's plenty of bearing manufacturers that make different items. Now the other thing is, these holes, oh, that's another picture, uh, this flatness, I want to keep from zero to two tenths all the way across. Same on the main bearings. And you'll look at stroke difference on a racing crank, it'll be plus one to minus three. That's kind of the spec. On a repaired crank, it's going to be plus zero to minus two. And if you think about it, guys, if you send a crank in for repair and you grind it and now it's a plus one and you had all your other pistons and rods fit and now this one, the piston's sticking out, you don't want that. So that's why there's two different specs depending what you're doing. Now, how do you get that roundness? Well, the only way you do it, this is called an Arnold gauge and it's a three-point gauge and this goes over the main journal or rod journal but here's the trick. If I start out at four and a half thousandths, I'm gonna end up down here two or better. Well now, if you're doing production crank rework, you do not have the time to go to these specifications. Racing cranks, that's where they're more expensive because this is only time and operator. And of course, when you, when we call it rounding up, in other words, I have it in the grinder and I'm grinding and I'm watching this thing come down to three, down to two, down to one, down to a half, and I'm listening and I can hear it round up as I get to my point. So if a guy is listening to the radio, I don't want him grinding my cranks, you know. I, now this is a snap gauge and the same thing. This is intense but this is where you're using after polish because you don't want this crank spinning and put something on it to mark the thing up. But these are masters, okay? And so you have to have a ton of masters or you use air gauges, but the same thing. An air gauge may have three or five points it's doing, or in this case it's one and you're gonna snap it on carefully. And again, you want to make sure when you're done polishing that you have not put dips or whips or whirls or you want it round. So like this is a master gauge that goes 0. 0.0000, guarantee. And uh, all these things are expensive. That's why you don't see them in a, in a normal shop that's doing just regrinding cranks. The flange is an important area. Now one, this has, this is a racing diesel rear crank and it has eight bolts in it. Also, this flange is critical because the flange, you don't want any more run out than what it is at the main. So you'd like zero, you'd like this at zero, it may go a tenth out, okay? But this is what you want, your flywheel, your flex plate, whatever you're bolting on there, 
should be a precision fit to that center. Now the bolts, now this is a six bolt, so is this. And of course we have this timing ring on it which gives your crank timing and ends up being your, where your camshaft is. But anyway, eight bolts have more clamping load than six bolts. And when you go from an LS engine to a LS7, they went to eight bolts. Reason is they needed more clamping load to keep that part on. Uh, side note, when I did 100 years ago the uh, Pontiac Super Duty four cylinder, I had 10 bolts. And the reason for that, at 8,000 RPM, we had over 14,000 vertical shake, 10,000 pounds longitudinal shake. Well, you needed stuff to hold on, it was horrible. Now this is the 100 year old way of polishing. And I know you guys are gonna tell me that you can do a perfect job. You use a bolt that's worn out, you put WD-40 on, you have all these tricks. The problem is if you don't have a hard backing, your shape is horrible. The other thing is if you put as much as one little line around, you will lose 15% in durability, creating a fracture point. Now this is a Rossler machine. This is how you get a fully, that crank picture is using this. Now this is media, and then it has a, a recipe of other things that go in with it. But that crank you saw, that is a 12 hour process to get that crank. And so you have a rim, which, which we use on the lifters, but it doesn't work as well on a crankshaft. So Rossler's kind of been one of the companies that stepped up. But just like the rim, they tell you just do this and this and you find out, no, there's a whole learning curve and your special recipe to make it work the way you want it. Now, when we get done, we want to have the radiuses at two micro or better. But the difference is here, there is no circumference pattern on the radius. It's polished through being scrubbed. Now on the journal itself, if we might put it under a microscope, you would see polishing lines. But you don't want that on the radius. So that's why you have two different types of machines. <clears throat> now this is QPAC micro finishing machine. And this is a 15 micron paper. Now they did these cutouts to supposedly polish the radius. It, one, it doesn't do a real good job, but the point is I don't want the circumferal, the marks around it. So this is really the first process is doing the rods and mains both with this QPAC machine, this 15 micron tape and we want to get two or better. But you see here, the trick is, this is a 100% cylindrical, the size of the main or rod. So therefore, you don't get bumps, hoops, anything. So again, we're looking flatness within zero to two tenths. This is a Sheffield Precision Measuring Lab and what this does is determine index, which is where are the crank pins to each other, and also what the stroke is. Now, this is a computer program that you touch off and it gives you the results you want. Now, just to give you an idea, we want the index to be zero to minus two. Now, it's very difficult when you get a crankshaft to look at the index. It's easy for you. I got a lot of stroke checkers to determine what the stroke is. So you kind of take the word and, and really the, the companies I mentioned, they do a great job in hitting the tolerances. So uh, this instrument, Sheffield, this is probably a $15,000 kit, you know, but that's what it takes to know what you're building. Now crankshaft materials. 
So we got four, and then I'm talking performance now. So we got 4340, 4330, and fuel is ENB 30. Now everybody says my imported cranks 4340. I'll guarantee you guys it isn't. It's not like 4340 that I would buy from Timken or some other manufacturer in the United States. Now 4330, the three here is one tenth less carbon. Now the new LS LT cranks are 4340. Chevrolet finally got off the nodular iron crap and went to a good material. And that's why people love these things, put hoppers on them, you know, I mean, and they get away with a production crank. The thing is the 4330 has vanadium in it and the vanadium allows you to get the hardenability easier where you want it. So your billet stuff is always 4330, okay? Now 4340, you tried it. Now on a fuel crank, that's this ENB30, and again, three manufacturers that make a fuel crank, uh, and uh, Bryant, uh, Callies, and uh, Winberg. Yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. Now, the thing is, you through harden that crank. Now, when you through harden a crank, you cannot straighten it. You know, you might think, I'll just put it in a press or I'll beat on the radio. It didn't want to change it. So now, just to build this crank, now that's 5,300 bucks for a fuel crank that maybe makes it eight passes, maybe you get lucky and get 15. So going fuel racing is expensive. But now we're heat treating it to a 55 RC. But before we do it, every surface on the crank is 140 thousandths oversize. So now when you get it back, you've got to grind all the mains, rods. Now, this flange is 55 RC. Now I got to drill it, I got to tap it, I got to drill the front nose of the crank, tap it, and they use, it's a special, uh, carbide high pressure drill but when you break one 155 bucks out the window so and then your taps are crazy too so one very hard to build these things and that's and so everything is longer 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 now the what I like is on the EMB 30 is uh, Timken by the Timken billets Stuff's right on, same every time. But when you see this, don't be surprised. If you guys had to build it, you'd go, I'm not gonna do that, you know? And that's why there's just a few people doing it. So uh, I know you guys, if you took, take a file and drill it for me, see how much fun you have. Engine oil flow, a small block Chevy, whether it's an LS or an old 350 or a big block, five gallons a minute is what it takes to run the engine. Now, pressure and flow. If I had my way, we would not have oil pressure gauges, we would have oil flow gauges. So you knew you were getting enough oil to do the job. Now in a, today's cup engine, they're running nine gallons a minute. And you go, well, wait a minute, everything's so close tolerance and watched, why? Well, you forget there are a minimum of 16 uh, nozzles putting oil up to the underside of the pistons. Every spring is being sprayed, and it just takes this much oil to do the cooling that you're needing. Now, laminar flow is where you get the oil, it gets spread, so at the highest compression pressure you have some film thickness. Now this is a portion here, and so you can see the radiuses and the finish, and these holes, we, when I first started, we had fixturing and we moved the crank to seven different fixtures to get the oil holes in it. But we were using regular drills, and you would get circles inside the oil hole. 
Now it's all done CNC and you use a carbide tip and it's just a beautiful hole so it makes the oil flow through this area. Now today you still are, you have a specialist in the shop, maybe two or three, that put the radiuses on the oil holes and, and that's because you can ruin a crank right here or make it. So you have specialists that do it. Now, <clears throat> this is the, rod, the main bearing and the rod, and you have this angle. Now, there is a formula for this angle to help develop how much pressure behind the oil column as the RPM goes up. But more important than that, <clears throat> right here is top dead center. 12 to 14 degrees after top dead center is your highest compression pressure. So when I had Pontiac's money and working for GM, I built cranks that had the hole go from here, 30 degrees, 50 degrees, 60 degrees, and then I did one at 80. And every time I moved it farther back, the laminar flow would spread across the entire bearing by this point. So that's where this 80 degree ended. And so when you move this up, you do not have the laminar flow across that rod bearing at the highest point you need it. So that's just one thing that we worked on and that developed that. And what's surprising is when you look at a production crank today, it's real close to that. So kind of fun. Crank differences between these two cranks. Of course, a small block, the original stroke was 3480. The LSLT is 3.622, and of course, that changes with the LS7, bigger bore, smaller stroke. Rod diameter, 2100. Main diameter, 2448 to 2559. And the reason they did that is you wanted the overlap between the two. The snout diameter used to be two, two, four, six. And this is back in the, the day, people started putting uh, fluid dampeners on that weighed five million pounds and they'd break the nose off. So our position was, if you're gonna use a fluid dampener, we're not guaranteeing anything. But now fluid dampener has come out with an aluminum unit that is really cool. And the benefit is, the Hertz rate that it can cover is around 350 versus a dampener that let's say is a rubber dampener, it might have a 50 Hertz. So pretty cool thing to look at is the new fluid dampener. Now, of course, the, the material of the original one was nodular iron. They went to 4340, which is a big plus. The counterweights, because of the engine block, are smaller now they put the counterweights out so the balancing becomes easy to do. And a thing I really like is the thrust went from the rear to the center. Now, if I just had this crank, you Ford guys would say it sure looks like a Ford. Yeah, Ford had a better idea, okay? And uh, so now we've fixed the snout size. we put the thrust in the center. Why do I like that? because this crank is flexing. Now I'm controlling the length in the center, not at one end, okay? So that, that really is a help. So they did a wonderful job on this crank. And you see the thing is where you see, this is an aftermarket, and you see they wanted big holes. And I'm telling you, when you put holes in, you have to be careful where the oil holes transition. But the worst thing is, when you're cutting in and making this narrow, this still becomes the weak point of the crankshaft. Now, on this particular crank, you, with your thumb, you can figure the transition between the radius and the flat, and we don't want that. We don't want any edge. It should be a perfect, smooth finish. Uh, shaft Tech is a good friend, and he does repairs, and he has all the equipment shown in his repair shop and can go nitrite, do everything. And I'm just saying, if you have a race crank and you need it repaired, these guys can do it and they do a first class job. So 
Anyway, I thank everybody. Thank you very much. What a day, what a day, what a day. Uh, yeah, my brain, my brain is swollen. I've learned so much today. He told us, don't start cars. We are not going to listen.